Hello, my name is Ken Singer, and I'm the Managing Director and Chief Learning Officer here at the Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley. And I'm here to give you a short talk on why now is the best time to start a company in the middle of a pandemic. It turns out in history, many of our most successful companies were birthed in the middle of a economic downturn. In fact, you might be using technology from one of these firms right now to watch this video. As entrepreneurship educators, when we teach new entrepreneurs how to find an idea to commercialize, we typically tell them to go find an industry or a company and disrupt it. But what do you do when the world is already disrupted, when every industry is disrupted? The answer is, you look for shifts that were caused by that disruption. And those kinds of shifts come in the form of market shifts, technology shifts, legal shifts, and social shifts. An example of a technology shift is Uber. In order for Uber to exist, we had to invent the mobile phone, the internet on the phone, and GPS. Without those technology shifts, Uber couldn't exist. You couldn't coordinate the millions of cars and drivers that you need to do in real time. An example of a legal shift is GDPR. And if you're based in Europe, you know this new regulation. It requires large companies to protect their consumers' data. Now, they didn't have a way of doing that before, and so lots of small companies emerged out of nowhere to provide solutions and technology so the companies can stay compliant. This shift made the fortunes for many, many entrepreneurs. An example of a cultural shift is also Uber. Now, if you were to ask any American 20 years ago whether they would use their really nice car as a taxi to drive strangers around a city, you'd probably hear people laugh at you. There's no way they would do that. But today, it's normal. It's something that not only do we like to do, but it's a standard part of the economy. So this required a cultural shift away from people viewing a car as their personal kingdom to the car being a utility. An example of a market shift is Amazon. Over the last few years, Amazon has shifted so much of the consumer purchasing online that many other companies have had to follow suit. But they didn't have the resources, the labor, the infrastructure to compete effectively. So lots of companies emerged to provide things like customer service, supply chain, packaging, all of those things so that other companies can compete with Amazon. But the thing with shifts is that they giveth, but they also taketh away. In the example of Zoom and WeWork, both companies were relatively healthy before the pandemic. But with the shutdowns and the quarantining, Zoom skyrocketed because we still needed to meet even if we couldn't travel. But with WeWork, we couldn't go into work, and so they collapsed. This is the thing about shifts. They don't affect companies or people equally. It's an asymmetric effect. But with the COVID crisis, it was a systemic shift. It affected everything. Everyone, every business, every industry and country. Not symmetrically, of course, but it did have an effect on everything. And so when you have a systemic shift, how do you model the future? How do you know where your customers are going to be? How do you know whether they can pay? You can't. And so what we have is a situation where companies and people, frankly, could not make predictions about the next quarter. This is what I would call a black swan event. Now, I know some people would say this doesn't qualify as black swan because a pandemic was perfectly predictable. We've had them in the past and, of course, we'll continue to have them in the future. But we couldn't predict the way that society responded to this event. And if you look at how Sweden or Taiwan or China, Korea or different parts of the US responded to this crisis, you could see that it's virtually impossible to model out how society would respond and what the impact would be later on. What we mean by all systems have been impacted by this black swan is that all the levers of the economy have been affected. Everything from purchase power, customers don't want to buy or can't buy anymore. Risk aversion, businesses just don't make investments or grow in areas they used to grow. To travel, we can't get to work, so transportation shifts. Broken supply chains, 
Businesses can no longer get supplies from their suppliers. You can't get the packages from your vendors. And then of course there's capital flight, which is a really good marker of the economy. Our companies, our investors, our bankers investing or loaning money. And in a climate that's in heavy in risk, they tend to hold back their money. Now we experienced a lot of this at the beginning of the pandemic and things have shifted in that time, but not symmetrically. I keep going back to this theme of symmetric effects. They're not. And so this is the clue on how to innovate during this time. So how do big companies respond to a crisis like this pandemic? Well, typically they first freeze. They're big companies with lots of employees and lots of business units. It's hard to just change overnight. So typically they just freeze and reassess. After that, they start to cut their businesses back to their core. And the smart ones will eventually reprioritize and start shifting towards the new priorities. But that takes time. And so if you're a small company, a startup, the best way to take this time is to capitalize on the shifting priorities before the big companies do. So how do you capitalize on these new priorities? Well, first you have to identify what the new essential priorities are. And there are two basic methods of doing that. One is to go problem centric and the other is to go people or market centric. The problem centric approach requires you to recognize that problems have changed in their criticality. Some problems are just more critical now than they were before. And some problems that used to be pressing are no longer critical. Recognizing that allows you to see the new opportunities that have come with that reprioritization. Now, if you are in the hygiene industry, you know, with soaps and with face masks, you have become an essential priority. The other approach is the people or market centric approach. That is recognizing that behaviors have changed now that we are in the middle of a crisis. We can't eat at restaurants anymore. We can't just go shop at a store. These changes in behavior open up whole new opportunities for entrepreneurs. So there's no better time than in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of changing environments, is there to create a new business. And that is because all of these things we talked about, all of these shifts of purchasing power and risk aversion, these impact large companies more than a startup. These big companies have huge liabilities. They have employees and labor unions and contracts and shareholders and debt. They can't just let them sit in limbo. They still have to service them and that costs billions of dollars. But if you're a small company, you don't have those liabilities. You can innovate now. You can invest in the future where the big companies cannot. So what's the key lesson in all of this? Well, there's actually three. The first is look for shifts to innovate. They're all over the place and they reveal themselves on a daily basis as this pandemic rolls along. The second is to go find other people who are different from you to collaborate with because they might have the key to finding one of those shifts that you don't even see. And the third is don't wait, start now.